Hi, my name is Wayne Martin. I live in Palo Alto, which is in California, which is in the Silicon Valley. Um, I have made a small number of videos so far uh, based on my uh, experiences with my Sony eBook reader, which I am quite uh, enthusiastic about. Uh, I have owned it for about six months now and uh, have integrated it into my workflow sufficiently well that I just wanted to tell folks um, about it whenever I could, sort of like an evangelist. A couple of people have shown, well, actually more than a couple, but a number of people have shown a certain concern about not being able to curl up in bed with a good book uh, if these kinds of, of readers were to displace uh, paper books in, in a great way. And uh, I uh, have done everything I could to uh, to allay that fear, and uh, this video and the other videos that I'll be making uh, are an attempt to uh, to pass the word along that uh, these things are quite quite nice, and uh, people really shouldn't worry about that sort of thing. Um, I got to thinking about other kinds of personal technology that we have uh, uh, in this country, and, and changes in personal technology over the, the last hundred years or so, and it dawned to me that I had some some cameras around the house that might be a, an interesting example of the transition of, of technology. This is a uh, Kodak Brownie camera. It's actually black. I don't know quite why they called it a Brownie. Uh, it was introduced in 1900. Uh, it's made of cardboard. It was intended to be a very low-cost device. It cost a dollar when it was originally uh, introduced. It had roll film and um, the camera in that form factor lasted well into the 1950s actually. Sometime in 1924, 35 millimeter film was developed, and 35 millimeter cameras were developed, and uh, in 1934-35, Kodak invented uh, what are called daylight canister or daylight loading canisters for 35 millimeter cameras, and that led to innovation uh, a few years later when the Argus company of Ann Arbor, Michigan released this uh, Argus 2 series camera. Um, this particular version, uh, let's see, this is very close to the, this is a 2AB which was developed uh, or manufactured close to 1950, uh, but the original 2A was very close to what this looked like. It sold for about $29. This particular model or device that I have in my hands was near the end of the manufacturing line, um, probably sold or probably manufactured around 1950. It was my father's camera. Um, he had it as long as I can remember, so he must have bought it around 1950. Um, this was my SLR, a single lens reflex. It's an Asai Pentax. I purchased it when I was uh, in the Army in 1971. It cost about $125 at the time. These cameras were, I, were sold through the Army post exchange system and were heavily uh, discounted, so they probably cost about $225 on the retail market here in the U.S. Um, this was a step up from my dad's camera because it had a, a, a photo meter built into it. Uh, which set the f-stops and the, uh, the shutter speeds automatically. Uh, I took an awful lot of good pictures with uh, over the years. Um, in the last 10 years or so, we've seen digital cameras come along. Um, my camera, my digital camera is currently busy, so I can't show you a picture of it. It's a Samsung. Um, this is the back of my audio recorder. My Samsung is about half this size, as most digital cameras are these days. Um, my Samsung cost about $170, and it produces what are called internet-ready JPEGs and, and uh, video and audio. Um, all of that change from this original, rather tedious box camera to my Samsung, or for that matter, the digital camera era that we're in, has taken about 100 years. Um, up until 1950, there wasn't a lot of change, but after 1950, when the transistor was uh, was developed, uh, in the early 50s anyway, uh, 
people began to see all sorts of things they could do with transistors and they eventually married them with optics and, and cameras and we have the magical little digital cameras that uh, that I'm being photographed today with by by with today and which will shortly upload my video onto the YouTube um, these guys are just another example these ebook readers are another example of how personal technology changes over time uh, certainly the Gutenberg technology or the printed book has been a marvelous invention been with us for a long time and uh, it is a very very convenient thing to, to have but this device will hold 20,000 books and uh, there are other memories in, in the wind that will potentially put two million books on a form factor like this one of these days. Um, change is inevitable and so for folks who are concerned about it or who, uh, who are scared or perhaps scared is too harsh a word, go to a Sony store. Um, find somebody in the coffee shop that's, uh, that's reading with one of these things um, or on a bus and stop and ask them if you can talk to them about it. Uh, I have people coming up to me all the time and I love to spend a few minutes. It actually takes about 10 minutes to walk someone through all the features of one of these things. Um, the, the, the future is now when it comes to reading. We're seeing some, some really interesting changes in the, in the electronic publishing world where inking technology has uh, allowed manufacturers to uh, like Sony or, or Amazon and now there's a company in Mountain View called Plastic Logic that's about ready to release an 8x11 version of a, of a reader with e-ink technology. Um, the ability to, to hold as many books as you want, to interface wirelessly as we can with the, uh, with the Amazon, uh, and the ability to have hundreds of thousands of millions of books online is just another example of the, the march of, of digital technology uh, from the 20th into the 21st century. Uh, this is Wayne Martin. Thanks for watching.